Today, in episode 2 of the Learning Rust series, we're tackling Rust's flagship feature, the ownership model. Welcome to You Code Things. A massive thank you to those who subscribed. We're over 200 subscribers, and it's your support that helps me make more content. Finally, I loved playing your snake games, and they're so well written. I loved seeing GG Easy or Good Game Easy being used as well. Today we're going to get into some computer science and get a glimpse of what is going on behind the scenes of our computer program. Bad memory management is hard in Safe Rust because of the ownership model. It's also how Rust avoids using a garbage collector. The stack! Your program is now a person sitting at a desk with a lot of paper. The stack starts empty. Reading your code, the person starts with the main function. The function name is written on the top of the new sheet of paper. The page is now added to the stack. Going line by line through your code, variables and values are written on the paper. Here it's noted that variable A has the value 3. A function call is encountered. It's found in the code and a new sheet is grabbed. The process is repeated. A function name is written. This page is added to the top of the stack, covering the main function's stack frame. You can't access anything on pages beneath the one you're on. Again, they step line by line through the function, making sure to write things on our page. When the function ends, we could return something. But in this case, we just pop this page off the stack and throw it away. And we're back in the main function. The computer goes to where it was up to and continues. At the end of this main function, we throw away the page or stack frame and our program is left holding on to no resources. The stack is efficient, quick, and solves almost all our problems. It is also essentially the concept of scopes. You can only access things in your stack frame. However, we can only add things to the stack of a fixed known size. It's when you know exactly how much memory to allocate by looking at the type of the value. An 8-bit signed integer, or I8, takes 8 bits in memory and is therefore sized. If I tell you something is a vector of characters or a string, how much memory will it take? The answer is, it depends. It depends how long the string is. And you may want to add letters or remove letters in the future. For this, we need something different. We need a heap or a locker room in this strange analogy. So I've slightly changed the code to assign a string to the variable A. The stack frame is still created, but when we reach the string, we don't just write down the string in our stack. Instead, we ask this locker room to give us enough lockers to store this string. The locker room, seeing that hello has five characters and requires five lockers, gives us back this locker key. On it, we see the starting locker, how many lockers we filled, and how many lockers we've reserved in total. We didn't know the precise size in memory of the string, but we do know the size of this locker key, or pointer. And this pointer is what we write on the stack. Let's change these names to be more serious. The starting locker is the pointer. The number of filled lockers is the length, and the number of reserved lockers is the capacity. If you delete the O off the end of hello, your locker key or pointer will change to reflect that. The pointer will stay the same, but the length will drop to four, and you still have all five lockers reserved, so capacity doesn't change. We'll come back to this shortly. The three rules of ownership as defined in the Rust book. One, each value in Rust has a variable that's called its owner. Two, there can only be one owner at a time. Before jumping into rule three, let's explore how data moves around and how we assign ownership to values. So we have this simple example. The variable x owns the value 42. Assigning x to variable a creates a copy of the integer 42 and makes a the owner. We end up with two 42s on the stack. Why does this copy happen? These types have a known size, so can be stored entirely on the stack. It's cheap and fast to copy them around. Here's a list of the copy types. What happens if we use a type where the size isn't known? We know that we get a pointer and we know the size of that pointer. In this case, can we just copy this pointer? This is not okay. The value hello stored in the heap suddenly has two owners. This breaks rule two of the ownership rules. We can't have two owners because if one changes the string, there is no way for the other to know. The pointers get out of sync and when it's time to clean up the memory, two owners will try to clean up the value hello. This is a disaster. Rust knows this and uses a move instead of a copy. Moving ownership to the new variable makes the old variable invalid. Variable x is now invalid and will throw a descriptive error if used. This move is fast because we're only copying this pointer. Oh, you, you do want two variables with that string. Well, then you'll need to clone it. This obeys the rules of ownership. Three, the final rule. 
When the value goes out of scope, the value will be dropped. Hey, we've already covered scopes briefly. They're those pieces of paper we were writing our program variables and values on. This rule says, if we are throwing away the piece of paper or are at the end of a scope, any variables on that page that own values are dropped or cleaned up or killed. Those values are gone. Function arguments are similar to variable assignment and can take ownership. Here we've made a function that takes ownership of a string and drops it. The drop happens when the owned value drops out of scope. Let's work through this using our paper stack frame analogy. We start with the main function. Variable x owns our string value, which is stored on the stack as a pointer to the string's location in the heap. We now pass x into the drop string function. We grab a new stack frame, write the function name on the top and write down the argument values. The string's ownership is moved to the argument s and x loses ownership. The function ends ending the scope and we throw away this stack frame. Rule three says if the owner goes out of scope, the value is dropped. And so our string s is dropped, destroyed, killed, it's dead. And you could return ownership of this value from the function too, if you wanted. We don't really want to be always passing around ownership and there is a solution. Borrowing. The borrowing rules are like so. If you want to hand out read-only access, you can hand out as many borrows as you like. We borrow by using the ampersand. These variables borrow from x and make x read-only. While x is borrowed by z and y, the value is immutable. We cannot change it. If we want to change x once we've finished with borrowing, we can create our own little scope. When z and y reach the end of this scope, their borrow ends and x is free to mutate itself. You can also borrow mutably by putting a little ampersand with a mute keyword. In this case, only a single mutable borrow can occur at a time. This clear string takes a mutable borrow, mutating the string by clearing it. But the ownership remains outside the function. The caller of a function can see which arguments take ownership, which are read-only borrows, and which are mutable borrows just from the type signature. There's really only one other borrowing concept, and that is borrowing slices of a vector or list. Here you borrow a portion of a string or vector and then the same rules apply. You can even grab non-overlapping mutable slices to a vector by using the method split at mute. Great for your quick sorts, am I right? Check out chapter four in the Rust book linked below. It's well written, full of examples and my main resource for this video. Go code something amazing. <laughs>